Okay, welcome back. Let us continue with our lecture. Currently, we are in the chapter on the Dirac equation and the quantization of... Ah, thank you very much. <laughs> ah, oh, the very thick, old-fashioned chart. Okay, uh, very good. So we are in our section on the Dirac equation and the quantization of the Dirac field. And uh, the last um, topic in our blueprint of what we always need to do in the canonical quantization procedure is to check what is actually the spin of the particles that we have created by this canonical quantization of the Dirac field. Therefore, we need to define uh, our momentum and angular momentum and boost operators. In other words, we need to define the representation of our Poincaré group on the Hilbert space of quantum states. And we have already begun by uh, defining the energy momentum tensor and this uh, tensor uh, for the conserved co uh, current corresponding to Lorentz transformations and Lorentz invariance. And today we will from those define the momentum and angular momentum and boost operators. And then we can determine uh, the Lorentz transformation properties of our created particles. and. Uh, in that way, we will determine the spin, which will turn out to be one half, of course. But let us uh, go through the details. So these were the expressions that we uh, came up with the last time from the Noether theorem. These are conserved quantities. Uh, rho is always the index corresponding to this uh, conservation law. The zero component is the conserved charge or the charge density and uh, the spatial components are the current densities and together they satisfy this usual continuity equation like the electromagnetic current. And so let us now define the corresponding Noether charges. Charges in quotation marks because the charges correspond to conserved quantities like angular momentum and uh, ordinary momentum and energy. So there is first of all the conserved quantity for translation invariance, which is the integral. First it's called p mu, the momentum operator, and it's the uh, three-dimensional integral over the zero component of uh, the t rho mu tensor. And then we have the conserved quantity for Lorentz invariance, which we call j mu nu which is the d3x integral over this m0 mu nu. And both of those quantities are given here, so we don't need to copy it here. But in that way, we have defined expressions for conserved quantities. And on the classical level, if the equations of motions are satisfied, they will satisfy d by dt of that equals zero. And on the quantum level, we can now use those expressions and insert into the fields the field operators and then we have defined operators which are defined on our quantum theory on the Hilbert space of states and uh, these operators will satisfy certain very good properties. Let us immediately write down those quantum level properties which are analogous to the quantum level properties of those operators in the case of the scalar field, but they are of course a little bit more complicated. So, and uh, we obtain quantum operators by simply replacing psi by psi hat in p mu and j mu nu. So, what are those properties? The first property is again that these uh, operators now satisfy the correct commutation relations for a representation of the Poincaré group. And in the case of the scalar field, I think we have checked one example. Here we will not check any example in the lecture, but you are welcome to check all commutation relations at home. It is simply plugging in 
all the known computational relations from the canonical quantization into these operators and into those expressions, then you can explicitly verify that all the computational relations that should be valid are actually valid. Second, these operators here are Hermitian, just by their definition. They are Hermitian operators, and therefore the representation of our Poincaré group is a unitary representation because that would be uh, e to the i times those operators, and so therefore uh, we have defined a unitary representation of the Poincaré group. And remember that this was a decisive necessary condition on a consistent relativistic quantum theory, and so that decisive condition is now satisfied. Third, the quantum field operator, Psi, hat satisfies now a relationship um, in connection with this unitary representation of the Poincaré group. So let's give it a name here. So this defines a unitary representation u of lambda comma a, the same name as usually. And so now if we apply this operator in the following way, u dagger of lambda a, then a field operator psi hat at the argument lambda x plus a, so a Lorentz transformed argument, and u of lambda a without dagger, then we get s of lambda times psi hat at x. A very complicated relationship, which as we have discussed a few times also in the exercise, how many different representations of Poincaré are combined here? Here we have the standard Poincaré transformation of a four vector in space time, x goes to lambda x plus a. Here, that is the four by four matrix valued representation of the Lorentz group on the space of Dirac spinors, right? That's a numerical four by four matrix. And these matrices also satisfy the representation property for Lorentz transformations. And that is our unitary representation of Poincaré on the Hilbert space of states. It's a unitary operator on an infinite dimensional vector space. So this representation, that representation, and this, they are combined here. And our field operator, psi hat of x, satisfies this relationship. And that uh, you can check it by looking at the commutators for infinitesimal uh, Poincaré transformation. So if you plug in infinitesimal transformations, then the left-hand side simply becomes a commutator of uh, the field operator with those generators. And that can, of course, be explicitly evaluated because these uh, operators contain Psi and Psi dagger. And we know all the commutation relations of Psi and Psi dagger. Therefore, this is explicitly calculable, and the result is this very nice form, and that signifies psi hat as a Dirac field operator. So psi hat is a Dirac field operator. So, and again, I will not check this because this is all elementary. It's a few lines of commutation relations in all these cases. But now let us slowly progress to something interesting and uh, to continue, uh, we now have to uh, become a little bit more specific. Namely, we need to choose a specific basis of spinors of u and v spinors, which in other words means that we give a meaning to our index s. What do we all mean? We have this uh, sum uh, always s equal plus minus one half sum over u of p comma s times a of p comma s, this sum. 
right? This is an important sum which appears in our field operator, psi hat. And uh, so in the field operator, there appears this, and there appears a similar sum with p dagger and uh, v of p and s spinors. And uh, we did not yet say what is actually the meaning of the index s. We only said s takes two values, and two values are clear because we knew that the spinors u, they have to be eigen spinors to the p slash matrix with eigenvalue plus m. There are two linearly independent eigenvectors of that kind. Therefore, we can label the two by some index s within values plus minus one half. Why not? This is at the moment just a label. But now let us define further properties of those two linearly independent spinors. There would be infinitely many possibilities and all of those possibilities are equally correct. But we can now make a choice. Let us make a clever choice instead of an unclever one. And uh, for this, let us uh, go to some example. Uh, let us choose the momentum parallel to the z-axis. Or a momentum equals zero in the rest frame. If we have a massive particle, we didn't actually specify whether the mass is zero or non-zero. But uh, if the mass is non-zero, we can go to the rest frame. But uh, if the mass is zero or non-zero, it doesn't matter. We can always choose a momentum in that direction. Let us uh, choose such a momentum and then think about the meaning of the index S. So how should we define our two linearly independent eigenspinors of the P slash matrix? We have then commutator of P slash with uh, the Z um, uh, spin matrix, that commutator is zero. Why is it zero? Because P slash now contains only gamma zero and gamma three, right? Uh, the momentum has an energy component and it has maybe a three component so that P slash contains only gamma zero and gamma three. Gamma one and gamma two do not appear in this sum. SZ is the commutator of gamma 1 and gamma 2 times i over 4. That is SZ. Okay, and then you see gamma 0 or gamma 3, they both commute with this uh, product of gamma 1 and gamma 2. And therefore, this commutator is zero, and that tells you from ordinary quantum mechanics, you have two operators which commute and therefore you can find simultaneous eigenvectors to both operators. So therefore our uh, u spinors should be eigenspinors to p slash with some eigenvalue plus m. And so now a useful label would be that uh, we define the two independent ones as eigenspinors of the z-spin matrix because that is for sure possible according to this relationship. And as z is an explicit matrix with plus minus one half on the diagonal. Therefore, the eigenvalues are plus minus one half. And so now that means that we should choose or a useful choice is to define u of p comma s as the eigenspinors to s z with eigenvalues plus minus one half. And therefore, we now choose s z equal on uh, p comma s equal plus s at times u of p comma s. And the same is of course true for the uh, other spinors v where which have p slash v equal minus m times v. They can also be chosen simultaneously as eigenspinors to uh, spin z. But now a trick comes, so let us choose here minus s times v of p comma s. And in both cases, s equal plus or minus one half. So and this is just my choice. You will soon see why it is a useful choice, but anyway, uh, it's clear that uh, again, for V, you have two linearly independent ones, uh, which can be chosen as eigenspinors 
to SZ with a two eigenvalues plus minus one half, and I just reverse the meaning. So if you have here plus one half, it has the eigenvalue minus one half, just to confuse you. But it also has some advantages. So then, now let us calculate something. Let us choose again p parallel to e uh, z or uh, zero. And let us now look at a specific type of Lorentz transformation. Namely, let us choose as a Lorentz transformation lambda a rotation around the z-axis. So that simple just means let us choose a rotation around the z-axis with some arbitrary angle. Then we know Lorentz transformation of our four vector p gives us in general a new four vector p prime. But in this case, uh, if you rotate a vector which is in the z-axis around the z-axis, the vector stays the same. Therefore, in this particular case, lambda p is equal to p itself. The whole four vector stays unchanged. So this Lorentz group is an element of the little group in our language that we introduced some time ago. So let us consider such a Lorentz transformation in the little group. Then, if we apply this relationship here, this uh, third one, with a complicated Lorentz or Poincaré transformation of the field operator, we can now write this down in the following way. U of lambda, let's only use a Lorentz transformation, and this particular Lorentz transformation, U of lambda, times the field operator, lambda x, times uh, U of lambda, is equal to S of this specific Lorentz transformation, which is a rotation around the z-axis. And let us now uh, imagine our field operator is a Fourier integral with this dp tilde and the sum over s containing such terms. And then again, this equation must be valid for each Fourier mode and it must be in particular valid for the Fourier mode in front of that sum on the upper blackboard. And that means that we get a u dagger of Rz times sum over s, u of p comma s, a of p comma s, u of Rz equal, and now we have here s of this rotation around the z-axis times the same sum u p comma s a of p comma s. So that just means that the equation must be valid for each Fourier mode individually and that is one Fourier mode. Uh, and in principle I would have here uh, lambda x that translates into lambda p, so I would have here in general p prime, but p prime is equal to p, so we have here the same p on the left hand side as we have on the right hand side. Then what is this uh, u of rz? That is actually e to the minus i some angle theta z times our representation operator Jz for angular momentum in the z-direction. Uh, that is this. And this s is e to the minus i theta, the same uh, theta angle, times our sz 4 by 4 matrix. So, and now we uh, discover that since we have chosen our spinor u of p comma s, as an eigenspinor of the SZ matrix, we know how that transforms under the matrix S because that is an eigenspinor, so it just becomes e to the minus i theta z times the number S. Okay, and then it would be in the sum.
And here you get uh, e, to, uh, e to the minus i this operator from the right and the same operator with plus in the exponent from the left. And then you can look at the entire equation for infinitesimal angles theta. Then what happens to the left hand side? On the left hand side we get the commutator of the expression here with the operator jz. The commutator only does something with the operator a because that is an operator while that is a number. So here we get the commutator of a with jz. On the right hand side we get the eigenvalue s times the spinor u of p and the operator stays what it is. And so therefore we can now read off what is the commutator of a uh, of p comma s with the full angular momentum operator jz on our Hilbert space of states and the result is our index s times the same operator a of p comma s. And so here I've also removed the sum and the spinor because in the end uh, the equation must be valid again for each linearly independent spinor. And so I can read off the coefficient of each spinor for each value of s and then I obtain an equation which is just an equation for the angular momentum of this creation or annihilation operator a of p comma s. Good. Now uh, the same can be repeated for the operator b involving uh, the spin or v which has the opposite side, the sign. In the case of b something similar happens but I would get here b dagger and here I would get minus s because of that. But here I can also convert this relation into a relationship with a dagger instead of a by daggering the whole equation. Then I get also here a minus and then the equations for a and b become the same. And so now I will just write down the general result. In general we obtain now the following all written in a uniform way. Jz with a dagger of p comma s this commutator this is now plus s times a dagger of p comma s. So you get that directly by daggering the previous equation. And similarly jz commutator with p dagger of p comma s also gives plus s times b dagger of p comma s. And here I get a plus because of that choice of the minus here before. The relative plus minus comes because in one of the terms I have a, in the other I have a dagger. And in order to make it uniform I need the relative minus. So in these equations tell you what is the spin or in general the angular momentum of the particle states created by a dagger and b dagger. Because if you now create out of the vacuum a one particle state then this tells you what is jz operator applied onto that state. Namely plus s and s is plus minus one half. Let's just write a few more words. You can do it similarly for general momenta which are not necessarily in the z direction. There we can choose a the following. We can take the spin vector uh, and project it onto the momentum axis. This projection is called helicity. This is the helicity of the particle, the spin in momentum direction. And uh, here in that case that was simply the spin in that direction because the momentum was already oriented in that direction. So that was already helicity. But in general you can always take helicity and that always commutes with p slash. Let's not prove it but that always commutes with p slash and therefore you can always choose the spinors such that uh, that acting on u of p comma s is plus s times u of p comma s. So all the spinors can be chosen as eigenstates of helicity. Okay. 
and then uh, this equation is modified similarly. If you choose that, then A dagger and P dagger create particles of helicity S, which is either plus or minus one half. Okay, and uh, then let me just write down some more explicit equations. So you can now create a one particle state out of the vacuum by applying this A dagger of P comma S. That would be, let's say, a fermion F, let's call it F for fermion, with momentum P and helicity S, where, again, P0 is an abbreviation for P vector square plus M square. So it is a particle with helicity S and uh, energy momentum relation such that the rest mass is M. Similarly, B dagger of P comma S acting on the vacuum gives you an anti fermion with momentum P and S, the same energy momentum relation, and S in all cases is the helicity. Then, as the final word, let me also connect to something that is written in the Spinor script. There is so-called wave functions, which you can now construct. Namely, if you have such a one-particle state, you can build the following matrix element, vacuum on the left, then a field operator, psi hat of x, and then your particle state, fermion, P comma S. What is the value of that matrix element? So here we have acted on the vacuum with A dagger. The field contains A without dagger and B dagger. Which term out of, uh, so this contains A and B dagger. Which of the term contributes both or none or one of them? So here that would be A dagger on the vacuum. Then yeah. only, A. only the A contributes and the B dagger gives zero because B dagger acts to the left onto the vacuum. That is the same as B acting on the vacuum that is zero. So that gives zero and the A contributes A, A dagger. That gives always this typical normalization factor, two pi cube times two P zero times the delta function. And so therefore, in the integral, the dP tilde integral gets canceled, the sum over S gets canceled, and the only thing that remains is the coefficient inside of the field operator in front of the component with this momentum and that spin S. And that is then, e to the minus i p x times the spinor u of p comma s. So this matrix element here between a one particle state, the field operator and the vacuum reconstructs for you this spinor u of p comma s. So you see that that spinor has an interpretation. It describes an incoming fermion with a certain momentum and spin. Similarly, you can do it for an antiparticle with psi bar, psi bar, anti fermion p comma s. Okay, so here you act with b dagger onto the vacuum, and psi bar contains b and a dagger. Then of course only the b contributes and the a dagger cancels, and we get similarly e to the minus i p x times the spinor V bar of P comma S. And so the matrix element has here on the left a state of an anti-fermion, so that uh, would be something like an initial state with an anti-fermion, and so therefore in Feynman diagrams later on, an initial state fermion 
will be accompanied with such a wave function u of p comma s and an initial state anti-fermion will be accompanied with v bar of p comma s. And so you can also read about all these things in the Spinor script where there is um, in more colloquial language uh, where this is all summarized again. Okay, so this ends our blueprint discussion of the fermions. Okay, we have now um, completely analyzed the physical meaning of our Dirac field quantization. And uh, here we see that we describe spin one half particles or helicity plus minus one half particles. We have constructed the Poincaré representation, therefore it's a fully relativistic quantum theory with a very uh, explicitly clarified physical interpretation. Any questions? So for exactly in the calculation, can, did we saw that it was one half? We, first of all, um, saw that our spinors, uh, u of p comma s, they had to be introduced and uh, they, Okay, uh, sorry, let me back up. So, okay, so here um, we, the main thing is the commutator of our creation and uh, annihilation operators with a full angular momentum operator of the theory. So that is what we need to evaluate. And during the evaluation in intermediate steps, the field operator appeared. This contains our spin or U of P. Uh, they are eigenspinors of this asset matrix, and this matrix uh, has eigenvalues plus minus one half. And this eigenvalue plus minus one half of the spinors, this propagates into this uh, equation for the commutation relation with a full angular momentum operator. Therefore, uh, the particle states created, they have really angular momentum in a certain direction here um, of plus minus one half. That is a necessary consequence of the representation because how did this set four by four matrix with eigenvalue plus minus one half appear? It appeared because the field operator satisfies this relationship where that representation appears. And so of course in this way you see uh, clearly the connection to the very beginning because of course we started with saying we want to um, um, analyze a field which is this one half comma zero or zero comma one half representation of the Lorentz group. That uh, was the starting point and that immediately gave rise to this representation of the Lorentz group, which uh, automatically has eigenvalues plus minus one half. That is uh, the construction principle of this one half comma zero, zero comma one half representation of the Lorentz group. So th that is where the one half initially came in. And that of course propagates through the entire construction and it's no surprise that in the end the eigenvalues of those matrices appear in the commutation relations. But the starting point was that we wanted to have a field which transforms in this uh, one half comma zero, zero comma one half or Dirac uh, representation of the Lorentz group. And uh, this recipe of canonical quantization, one should really consider it as a recipe, is a recipe which uh, preserves this initial property throughout the entire formalism. Okay, other questions? Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I know the, um, that the antiparticle is described by the spin of E. And now in Blackboard it says that, that the antiparticle also has the P0 of plus this term. And so it's the, because it was the P slash plus antiparticle. Um, there is a difference between uh, P slash and P square. So clearly the spin or V, it satisfies P slash V equal minus M times V. But uh, on the other hand, the P, which is inside this, satisfies P mu, P mu equal plus M square. That is always true. So, and there is no contradiction between these two equations. And in our field operator, the important thing is the DP tilde 
integration measure, which uh, makes sure that this relationship holds, including the sign. So this measure contains the requirement that P0 is positive. And that is, of course, by the way, a difference between our quantum field theory formalism here, where we always have manifestly positive energies, and some treatments of the Dirac equation in relativistic quantum mechanics, where sometimes negative energies pop up in some calculations. Here, there are no negative energies anywhere in our calculations. They are manifestly uh, avoided by this construction. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we obtained this um, requirement that we need simultaneously positive energies and positive norm of our states in the Hilbert space. And that gave rise to Fermi statistics. Right? So this inconsistency of uh, these treatments where you have negative energy, they are visible in our formalism by this potential disaster of uh, negative norm states if we would choose the wrong bosonic statistics instead of the correct Fermi statistics. Right, other questions? Good, then let us nevertheless go on with the Dirac field a little bit more before we come to the next topic. I have two more sections on the Dirac field and we should do them both today. They are fairly short, but uh, there is a lot of technicalities to be said about the Dirac field which are important for uh, physics. So two sections on additional information on Dirac fields. The first is charge conjugation. So we specifically choose here a certain representation of the gamma matrices, which satisfies the following, namely, um, the Hermitian conjugate of gamma mu should be gamma mu, uh, gamma zero, gamma mu, gamma zero. What does that mean? It means that gamma zero is Hermitian. Gamma zero is Hermitian because then you have gamma zero decker is equal to gamma zero, gamma zero, gamma zero is equal to gamma zero. And all the other gammas are anti-Hermitian because for all the others you have gamma i equal gamma zero, gamma i, gamma zero, which is minus gamma zero, gamma zero, gamma i. Gamma zero square is one. So all the other gammas are anti-Hermitian and gamma zero is Hermitian. And we assume gamma mu star complex conjugation is equal to gamma two, gamma mu, gamma two. That means gamma two is imaginary and gamma two star is minus gamma two and all the other gammas are, uh, are real. And then also the set spin matrix, which is the uh, commutator of gamma one and gamma two. Gamma two is imaginary, gamma one is real and it has an I, so this would be real as well, as z star is equal to sz. And all these equations are valid in most normal representations. That is valid in the so-called Dirac representation, Weyl representation, and some other well-known representations. So this is nothing special to satisfy. But uh, let's go on specifically for this case. And then we define a matrix capital C is defined as i times gamma zero, gamma two. So this combines this like Hermitian uh, and uh, charge, con uh, sorry, complex conjugation. And then we define for each Dirac spinor psi, we define 
an object psi with a superscript c, which is supposed to mean the charge conjugated spinor, is defined as that matrix c times psi bar transposed. Okay. What is psi bar transposed? Psi bar transposed is the same as c times psi dagger gamma zero transposed is the same as c times gamma zero transposed times psi star complex conjugated. That is the same as gamma zero and then you can plug in that matrix C, gamma zero anti-commutes with gamma two, gamma zero square is the unit matrix. So that is the same as minus I gamma two times psi star. So the charge conjugated spin or psi superscript C is defined in this way, either in that way or in this way, they are equivalent. And then let us discuss what that definition means. Why do we call it charge conjugation? We call it charge conjugation because of two very fundamental and interesting properties which I want you to know. So first of all, if you have the following equation, that was actually an exercise in our quantum theory lecture that some of you have attended. I d slash minus m. Dirac equation, but now an interaction term plus E times A slash acting on Psi equals zero. That is a Dirac equation with interaction with an electromagnetic field A. And uh, that whole object here is a, a covariant, gauge covariant derivative minus m, but that is all not important here. But you see the uh, interaction with the electric uh, field is governed by an electric charge prefactor plus e. So if that equation is valid, then and that was your exercise. Automatically the following holds i d slash minus m minus e times a slash acting on psi c is also satisfied. So that is equivalent. If psi satisfies the equation with plus, psi c satisfies the same equation with minus. And so you see that the charge reverses its sign and that um, motivates the name charge conjugation. So I don't know whether we should prove that. Should we prove that? It was your exercise, so you can prove it at home by looking up the old exercise sheet. Let's look at something else. And if p slash on the spinors u is equal to m u and spin z s z acting on u equal s u and p slash v is equal to minus m times v s z v equal minus s times v, that was our um, condition, then you can show that the charge conjugated versions of u and v, they satisfy the following. p slash u c uh, is equal to minus m times u c s z u c is equal to minus s u c etc. So that you see that lo and behold the charge conjugated u is equal to v and the charge conjugated v is equal to u with the same arguments. So let me add in general this is valid up to normalization because of course uh, if I require some eigenvalue equations the spinors are fixed only up to some normalization but if I choose a clever normalization then we have re really the equality here and that is the normalization that I've chosen in the spinor script. So this is exactly valid for 
the normalization in the Spino script, which is of course also the normalization that we have always chosen here. And uh, using these equalities here, uc becomes v, vc becomes u, you can now uh, look at the final uh, equality. Namely, if we have our field operator in the quantized theory psi hat of x, then that was this dp tilde integral sum over s e to the minus i p x u of p comma s times a of p comma s plus the same with b dagger okay. u and a and v and b dagger then the charge conjugated field operator where now charge conjugation means literally uh, this thing here or equivalently that, where if you put in an operator, that would mean that you take the spinor with its four operator components and in each component you dagger it. Star becomes dagger, but for each component. So then, what happens? So if you uh, uh, dagger it, then uh, A becomes A dagger, B dagger becomes B, but u becomes uc, which is v, and v becomes vc, which is u. And so therefore, here you get uc is v, here you get a dagger, so v will be accompanied with a dagger, and u will be accompanied with b, without dagger. That means a and b are reversed. That's just the effect. a and b are simply reversed. They exchange their role. e to the minus ipx, u of p comma s, b of p comma s, plus e to the i p x, u, p s, and a dagger of p and s. So that's the simple uh, rule. So simply a is exchanged with b entirely. That's it. And everything else remains. And so in that way, you of course also see once again that this uh, charge conjugation operation exchanges particles and antiparticles in our interpretation of the quantized theory. So both of these issues, this one and that one, explain uh, why we call that here charge conjugation operation. So and the proofs are all obvious, so let us not uh, waste time with the proofs. Or do you want to see any proof? We might uh, put in a proof in the exercise if you want, but I do not really, uh, I see some. <laughs> okay. Good. That is what I wanted to tell you to charge conjugation. Yes, a question. Could you explain once more? Repeat the sentence that you said for different from the C into the To this one? Yeah, where you said that when it covers becomes bigger or vice versa. Ah, okay. Uh, yes. Mm. So uh, I meant this equation here. So on the um, level of numbers, psi star is clear what it means. You take the complex conjugate of each component because that is a four component object. But what does it mean to say psi hat star? Uh, that is not really a defined operation. But what I mean if I interpret this on the quantum level, is that uh, we have here our psi hat, which is a four component object. Psi hat first component up to psi hat fourth component. And the star means 
Now, uh, you should write it as dagger and transpose. That means each component gets a dagger, but we do not uh, get a row vector, you know. Uh, so psi dagger normally would be this, psi one dagger comma psi four dagger as a row instead of a column, but psi dagger transpose is this. That is simply the difference. And so on the level of operators, we should interpret this as psi dagger transpose. That is the interpretation on the level of operators. For numbers, it's the same. For operators, the star doesn't make sense. That is what I meant. Because here, the psi c has really the structure of a column spinor, of an ordinary spinor, which is, has this column shape. Good. Then the next topic on additional information, chirality. In particular, chirality versus helicity. So let us begin with helicity. Helicity, let's call it small h, is this p vector times spin vector divided by p vector magnitude. So it's the projection of the spin onto the axis of motion. So this is only defined uh, if you first have specified a particular particle state with a definite momentum. And this is a quantity which is useful because we could organize our spinors u and v and the operators a and b according to eigenvalues of helicity. Generally, clearly, this helicity has eigenvalues plus minus one half. And our particle states created by a and b, they are at first eigenstates of helicity. So that is nice. And also experimentally, helicity is a nice concept. You can measure it, you can prepare particle beams with certain helicities. So it is a physical quantity. And let's just stress that it is experimentally accessible. Good. But it is not Lorentz invariant. Okay, uh, why should it be? It's something connected to angular momentum. That's not necessarily Lorentz invariant, but let's uh, just make it explicit. It's not invariant under certain boosts. Let us imagine here our particle with momentum P in that direction. And uh, the spin is like some rotation. For example, here a left-handed rotation. That should be a left-handed uh, rotation. So this particle would be left-handed, has helicity equal to minus one half. So it turns left while it moves like that. Has helicity minus one half. Then let us do a certain boost. And now we can do a boost which is such that the observer goes into the same direction as the particle, but it overtakes the particle. So it runs faster than the particle. Then, so the boost should overtake the particle. What happens if you overtake this particle? So you as an observer are now just moving in the same direction. The particle is left behind you. Then the momentum of the particle just changes its direction. For you now, the particle momentum is in that direction, but of course the particle still turns in the same way. It of course still turns in the same way. Therefore, if you now project the spin onto the axis of momentum, the uh, rotation is the same, the momentum axis has reversed, so the helicity is now plus one. 
half. So and that simply shows you that by overtaking the particle with a boost, you can uh, flip the helicity and therefore the helicity cannot of course be a Lorentz invariant quantity. There is only one exception when the helicity can be a Lorentz invariant quantity and we have already discussed that in our analysis of the general Poincaré group and the little group of particle states, namely for massless particles. For massless particles we have actually proven that the helicity is Lorentz invariant and here it's clear that if the particle is massless it moves at the speed of light and no observer can overtake the particle. Then you understand that the helicity can be Lorentz invariant. So except, except for m equals zero. But in general the helicity is not Lorentz invariant. Okay, so much for helicity. Yes? Yeah, it's undefined. It is undefined. And for our spin norths, they would be defined in, in some convention. We would uh, always use the convention if you go to the rest frame, you treat the particle as if it would move with uh, in z direction. So the spin norths in the rest frame um, are organized according to spin z. That is just our convention. And also if you look at the explicit solutions in the spin norths script, uh, they are continuous if the particle goes to rest and uh, they converge to eigenstates of spin z. That is possible. You could also do other choices, but that's a possible choice. But helicity then is undefined. Now, however, let us turn to chirality. The concept of chirality is a specific concept for spinors. Chirality is a Lorentz invariant property of spinors. So it's not immediately a property of physical particle states or of physical states at all. It's a property of these Dirac spinors, these complex four-dimensional spinors. And so to define it, let us introduce finally the important matrix gamma 5. Gamma 5 is defined as the product of all the gammas. Gamma 0, 1, 2, 3 with upper indices and by convention for gamma 5 we only use the lower index. And let me immediately write down what is the result in the while representation. You can check it. It's a block matrix which has here minus 1, 0, 0, plus 1. Minus 1, 0, 0, plus 1. So a very simple diagonal block matrix with 2 by 2 blocks. And then we define projection operators P left. P left is uh, 1 minus gamma 5 over 2. So, and what is that? 1 minus gamma 5 over 2 in this while representation. This would just be the block matrix 1, 0, 0, 0 with 1s and zeros on the diagonal. Okay, so that is a projection operator which projects onto the first two components and it projects away the last two components. Then there is also a P right projector, 1 plus gamma 5 over 2, which is then 0, 0, 0, 1 in while representation. So it's also a projection operator which projects out the last two components of your spinor. And then we have some properties which are representation independent. So always gamma 5 square is the unit matrix. And you can immediately see it from this representation. What it's valid in general is the unit matrix. Then these operators PL, they are projection operators. That means PL square is equal to PL. PR square is equal to PR. This is called projection operator, such, an, such a property. And uh, they are projection operators on orthogonal subspaces. 
namely p left times p right gives the zero operator or the zero matrix. And uh, also p left plus p right gives the unit matrix. That is also obvious. So we have two projection operators on two orthogonal subspaces and together they uh, project onto the full space. Then the final very important property is gamma mu commutator with this new gamma 5, sorry, anti-commutator. That is zero. So gamma 5 anti-commutes with all the normal gamma mu matrices. So in using this gamma 5, we can then define the notion of chirality, left-handed and right-handed handedness. And you see this already in these indices, p left, p right, they will be projectors on what we call left-handed or right-handed. So that is the definition. Eigenstates of gamma 5 are called chirality eigenstates. And eigenstates of gamma 5 are spinors. Gamma 5 is a 4 by 4 matrix in the space of spinors, and so the eigenstates are Dirac spinors or variants. And so uh, chirality is therefore a property of spinors. <clears throat> Let us exemplify this a little bit with some relations. Let us take some general Dirac spinor psi which is a four component complex spinor as usual. And then what can we do? Using all these new matrices, projection operators and gamma five, we can first of all define a left-handed part of the spinor by projecting it with this P lift. In vital representation, it uh, are just the first two components and we annihilate the other two components. But in a representation independent way, you can always uh, do this projection. And then you have something called C left or left handed spinor. Similarly, of course, psi right is equal to P right times psi. Then what do we have? So we always have the full spinor psi is the sum of this psi left plus psi right because the two projection operators sum up to the full unit matrix. Therefore, uh, that is an identity and you can always construct from any spinor its left-handed and its right-handed parts. Further, let us act with gamma 5 on one of them. Let us act with gamma 5 on psi left. What happens? Let us act with gamma 5 on psi left and uh, let us do this now explicitly. So we have skipped many proofs today, but let's do this proof explicitly. So this is uh, P left acting on psi, that is P left. And now let's uh, for once evaluate this. So if we evaluate it, we have here gamma 5 times 1 minus gamma 5 square divided by 2, acting on psi. What, however, is gamma 5 square? Gamma 5 square is the unit matrix. Therefore, we get gamma 5 minus 1 over 2, acting on psi. And what do we now have? That is, of course, minus the projector P lift. So therefore, we get, in the end, that is equal to minus psi lift. So, if we define our left-handed spinor using this projection, then it becomes automatically an eigenspinor of gamma 5 with eigenvalue minus 1. So the psi left is a chirality eigenstate with eigenvalue minus 1.
And similarly, psi right, you have here a plus, 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 then it would be an eigenstate of gamma 5 with eigenvalue plus 1. So let's write that down. Psi left and right are chirality eigenstates. Gamma 5 psi left or psi right is equal to minus or plus psi left or psi right. So for any spinor, you can always construct a left-handed and a right-handed spinor, which is a chirality eigenstate. So that is nice, and so that exemplifies that such chirality eigenstates really exist. And now let us continue to discuss why this is interesting and important, and for that let us look at Lorentz invariance properties. Lorentz invariance. The Lorentz transformations are governed by our spinor uh, representation S mu nu, which is a uh, commutator of gamma mu gamma nu. And so now we have to ask what is actually the commutator of S mu nu with gamma 5? 20 seconds of time for you to think. What is this commutator? if you remember that that is i over 4 gamma mu gamma nu. So each term is a product of two gammas. And for each gamma we know that one over there, gamma mu, gamma 5, and he commutes. Yep. Right. So, um, just as a remark, I, it becomes increasingly complicated to always remember those product rules for commutators. So my strategy in order to evaluate things like this is always to simply start with the left-hand side of the commutator and then calculate until you end up with the right-hand side. So in this way, my strategy would be to start with that and try to uh, bring the gamma 5 step by step to the left with some intermediate steps. And so then I see that this is proportional to one term would be gamma mu, gamma nu, gamma 5. Let's just look at such a term. Then I know that I can bring the gamma 5 here and get a minus sign. So this would be minus gamma mu, gamma 5, gamma nu, okay, because of the anti-commutation rule. And then I can bring it once again to this place, and then I get plus gamma 5, gamma mu, gamma nu. And so then I see that this works for every term, and so I will get gamma 5 times s mu nu. So in this way, I see s mu nu gamma 5 is in the end equal to gamma 5 times s mu nu. And so this is a little bit safer to do it this way in cases where you have really products of many, many matrices, because that always works if you implement such a strategy and you do not need to remember which product rule you should apply. But anyway, you are right, and the commutator is indeed zero. What is the physics meaning of that zero? That has a physical meaning. Which physical meaning does it have? That is a generator for Lorentz transformation. So in general, full Lorentz transformations of spinors commute with gamma 5. That means if you have an eigen spinor of gamma 5 and you apply a Lorentz transformation, it remains an eigen spinor of gamma 5 with the same eigenvalue. So the chirality eigenstates, they are invariant under Lorentz transformations. So all the spinors with eigenvalue plus one, they transform into each other by Lorentz. All the spinors with chirality minus one, they also transform into each other by Lorentz transformations. And there is no mixture. You cannot Lorentz transform a minus one chirality spinor into a chirality plus one spinor. That doesn't work. So therefore, uh, yeah, let, let's first write it down. Chirality is invariant 
under Lorentz. And by the way, this is now important here, so let me stress it. When I say Lorentz in this chapter here, I always mean the continuous Lorentz transformations which are connected to the identity. This does not involve time reversal, space reflection, and these sort of things. Only uh, infinite Lorentz transformations which can be continuously um, uh, transformed to the identity. Oh. Continuous Lorentz transformations. Under those, chirality is invariant. So uh, that also means uh, the um, Lorentz representation is reducible because there are two invariant subspaces. There is the subspace of spinors with chirality minus one, which is invariant under Lorentz, and the other subspace of spinors with chirality plus one, which is also invariant under Lorentz. So the whole space of spinors uh, uh, is decomposed into two subspaces, which together fill up the whole space, and the subspaces are each invariant under Lorentz transformations. Such a situation uh, is what we mean by a reducible representation. So, two invariant subspaces. Good, and so since chirality is Lorentz invariant, it is obviously an important concept, an important thing to know about. And uh, in particular, since the two uh, Lorentz invariant subspaces are defined by their chirality properties, this is clearly an important um, thing to know. That is why I wanted to tell it, and uh, there is a little bit more. So let us also write down some relationships for the barred spinors, the adjoint spinors. What happens to them? Take a left-handed spinor, psi L, and now after making it left-handed, we bar it. Okay. So by this notation, I mean because the order uh, matters, we first project to left-handed, then we bar it. So that means literally we do p left psi and afterwards we bar it. That means by definition we do p left psi, then we decker it and then we multiply by gamma zero. So what does that mean? So psi decker, p left decker, gamma zero. Okay. Good. So psi decker is the same as psi bar gamma zero. Now what is p left decker? In our assumption, uh, it's already deleted, but we have assumed that uh, uh, only gamma zero is Hermitian, all the other gammas are anti-Hermitian, and therefore gamma five is Hermitian as well. So gamma five is Hermitian, then also p left is Hermitian because it's composed out of the unit matrix and gamma five. So P left decker is equal to P left. And then we have here gamma zero. Now again, 20 seconds of time. What is that? Gamma zero, P left, gamma zero. Yep. It's P right because? Exactly, so that is the thing. And that is what I meant by the order matters, because you see, first do psi left, then you bar is the same as psi bar multiplied from the right with p right. And similarly, of course, psi right bar is equal to psi bar p left. And so there are textbooks which write things like this, psi left, bar with a very, very short bar. That is an extremely bad notation because it exactly does not tell you 
which of the two options it means. So if you see a textbook with this, uh, then be careful. Okay, so but that is a relationship that is clear. And now let us also look at some terms in the Lagrangian. Our terms in the Lagrangian that we already know can be analyzed with respect to chirality. So let us analyze the known terms with respect to chirality. The Im most important term to create dynamics is the kinetic term. Psi bar id slash psi. What happens if we analyze this term with respect to chirality? What we can do is, uh, if it's not obvious, let us insert here at this point p left plus p right, which is one. But then let's also use p left is the same as p left square and p right square. So we add here p right left square plus p right square. Then the thing splits into two terms, psi bar i d slash p left square psi plus psi bar i d slash p right square psi. How can we now continue to rearrange the term? Of course, p left square is p left times p left, and one of the two p left factors can be commuted uh, around the d slash. So, uh, say p slash p left is equal to p right p slash, correct? Because the gamma 5 in the projector anti commutes. So if we put it to the other side of p slash, uh, the sign in front of gamma 5 changes. Therefore, we have some p slash times p left is equal to p right times p slash for any slashed quantity. So let us apply that here. Then we get psi bar p right i d slash p left times psi. So one of the p lefts has gone to the left and has become p right. And here psi bar p left i d slash p right times psi. And so then we can abbreviate using our previous abbreviations. So that thing here, psi bar p right is the same as psi left bar times i d slash times psi left plus here pi psi right bar i d slash psi right. So that means our kinetic term has been decomposed into terms containing chirality eigenstates. And what is the decomposition? We, we have one kinetic term for only psi left. Here psi left, psi left bar appears uh, with the normal d slash operator. And the other term contains only psi right. So psi left and psi right, the two chirality eigenstates, they can completely um, behave independently in the kinetic term. Let us compare that to the other term in the Lagrangian, which was the mass term, m psi bar psi. What do we get from m psi bar psi? Let us again here introduce p left square plus p right square. Then of course we have m psi bar p left square psi plus m psi bar p right square psi. And then introducing the abbreviations, that simply means here psi right bar times psi left plus m psi left bar times psi right. So the mass term combines left and right chiral spinors. But the kinetic term does not. And that is interesting because it tells you that actually the left-handed spinors, they could appear just completely on their own, alone in the Lagrangian, if you only want the kinetic term. This kinetic term here is that Lorentz invariant, by the way. 
Would it be allowed to write down only this into the Lagrangian? Or would it violate Lorentz invariance or something else? It's also Hermitian, clearly Hermitian. And it's Lorentz invariant because, of course, the psi left is a, a Lorentz invariant subspace. So that term is completely Lorentz invariant. And the second term is also Lorentz invariant. That was what I meant before psi left, psi right. They do not mix at all under Lorentz transformations. Therefore, this left term is completely possible as a kinetic term in a Lorentz invariant Lagrangian. We could omit the right-handed term. And then we could completely omit the right-handed spin or field. But not if we want a mass term. So if we want a mass term, then we need the left-handed and the right-handed spin ores. So that means that uh, in the massless case of uh, spin or theory, there appears an additional symmetry or an additional property, namely in the massless case where this term is zero, the psi left and psi right, they completely, they become completely independent. And you could omit one of them or take them both, doesn't matter, but they, anyway, they are completely independent of each other. However, a mass term is something like a mixing between the left-handed and the right-handed uh, spinos. And with some nice conclusions on this. So a uh, Lorentz invariant and also dynamical theory with kinetic term is possible with only psi L or of course only psi R. But this is only true if the mass is zero. Similarly, the fact with this kinetic term, psi left, psi right, they appear completely independently. It also means something about interactions. Psi left and psi right could have different gauge interactions. So we didn't discuss that yet, but you know it from other lectures that the gauge interactions like electromagnetism, they are simply introduced by making the derivative operator into a covariant derivative. So they appear like the d slash in the previous equation. So therefore also for them, psi left and psi right are completely independent and therefore they could have different interactions. And that is the case in the electroweak standard model where the interactions of the W boson and the Z boson behave exactly in that way and they make use of this fact that left-handed and right-handed spinors can have different interactions and they do have different interactions for the W and Z bosons. And then let me just summarize and give you some new words that you can remember. So there are different types of spinors and uh, all of those different types of spinors are now understandable for you uh, because of that discussion. So first of all, there is the Dirac spinor, which is what we have so far dealt with. The Dirac spinor is uh, our familiar spinor. It has four complex components. When we look at the dynamical theory in the Lagrangian, then we get constraints. We get these canonical constraints on some of the canonical variables. And uh, therefore, when we quantize, we do not get four times two degrees of freedom, but we only get four times one, namely four degrees of freedom. Four degrees of freedom, namely, particle, antiparticle, and s equal plus minus one half. 
those are the four degrees of freedom of the states in our quantum theory that we get after quantizing the Dirac spinor field. So four degrees of freedom and four complex components. Then there is the Majorana spinor. The Majorana spinor is simply a Dirac spinor of psi with the additional constraint that psi is equal to its charge conjugated version. So uh, that is a constraint and uh, yet another constraint in addition to those Lagrangian constraints and therefore we reduce the number of degrees of freedom by two. And uh, I've shown you what that means on the level of the quantum field. C means A and B, the creation and annihilation operators are exchanged particle and antiparticle are exchanged, so if psi is equal to psi c, it just means that particle and antiparticle are one and the same thing. Particle is equal to antiparticle. That is the additional constraint. They are just the same states. And why not? Could in principle be possible. However, we are not sure whether such a particle exists in nature. The known fermions like electrons, top quarks, neutrinos, for most of them we know that particles and antiparticles are different, but for the neutrinos we are not sure. The neutrinos could actually uh, be equal to antineutrinos, but they might also be unequal. So that is just an open question of uh, current physics. And so maybe neutrinos should be described by such Majorana spinors and maybe not. And the last type of spinors are the wild spinors. They are simply the left-handed spinor only. That is then really only this one half comma zero representation or psi right only. And this is then really only the zero comma one half representation. So they only also have less degrees of freedom because of additional constraints. And so for example, this psi left has then two complex non-vanishing components plus constraints in the Lagrangian. And if you quantize that one, then you get also half as many degrees of freedom. You get two degrees of freedom. But here particle and antiparticle is not the same. Instead, you only get one helicity. You only get one helicity uh, corresponding to either left-handedness or right-handedness. So particle, antiparticle with mass zero and Oh, okay, let me write it like this. The particle has only helicity minus one half and the antiparticle has only helicity plus one half. And the mass is zero. Okay. So mass equals zero means that the helicity is actually Lorentz invariant and the particle appears only with helicity minus one half and that then also explains the left-handed word the antiparticle, however, only appears with helicity plus one half, and both are Lorentz invariant because the mass is zero. And so it could be that the neutrinos are also behaving like this. That is really this open question. It could be that neutrino particle and antiparticles are different. And then, as far as we know, the neutrinos, the neutrino particles, they appear only with helicity minus one half in, in nature. Uh, actually, what I'm saying is, of course, true only in the limit where you neglect the neutrino mass, but the neutrino mass is not zero. But if it were zero, which is a good approximation, then it could have been that the neutrinos appear only with helicity minus one and the antineutrinos only with helicity plus one half. Okay, so these are the three types of spinors. And with that, we really stop our chapter on spinors, first of all, and then tomorrow we will continue with the next step in our quantization, namely spin one.
good. So see you tomorrow and uh, thanks for your attention.